The Soldier by Rupert Brooke first appeared in the magazine New Numbers in January 1915. It was posthumously published two months later in May 1915, along with four other sonnets known collectively as 1914, in the collection 1914 and Other Poems. Brooke was 27 years old when he enlisted in the Royal Navy Volunteer Reserve at the outbreak of the war. The reserve's first stationing was at Antwerp, in Belgium, where it stayed until early 1915. There was no military action there during this time, and so Brooke took advantage of the lack of fighting to concentrate on his poetry, producing the five war sonnets entitled 1914. He then sailed with the Mediterranean Expeditionary Force on 28th February 1915, headed to the Dardanelles in Turkey for the Gallipoli campaign. He never made it, however. A mosquito bite became infected and he died of sepsis, or blood poisoning, on 23rd of April 1915, on a French hospital ship, moored in a bay off the Greek island of Skyros. He died in the company of his close friend, William Dennis Brown, who wrote, I sat with Rupert. At four o'clock he became weaker, and at 4.46 he died, with the sun shining all round his cabin, and the cool sea breeze blowing through the door and the shaded windows. No one could have wished for a quieter or a calmer end than in that lovely bay, shielded by the mountains and fragrant with sage and thyme. As might be expected, due to Brooks not having experienced frontline combat, the moment of death and the action leading up to it are not considered. The poem, instead using language with Christian undertones, explores the nobility of sacrifice and the legacy he believes he will leave behind, focusing on both an idealised past and an idealised imagination of the afterlife. Opinions of Brooke's poetry are starkly divided. In the early months of the conflict, his quiet fortitude in confronting his own mortality and his willingness to sacrifice himself for a noble cause, were lauded by some, including Winston Churchill, who at the time of Brooke's death was first Lord of the Admiralty, and in charge of the disastrous Dardanelle naval campaign and the military landings at Gallipoli. In the ensuing months and years after the devastating losses during the trench warfare of 1916 and 1917, however, he was condemned for what was seen as his foolish naivety and sentimentality. Whatever your opinion of his poetry, however, it cannot be denied that it is an accurate representation of the mood and character of England before the true horrors of the First World War definitively reshaped them. The poem loosely follows the structure of a Petrarchan sonnet. It has 14 lines, divided into an octave, eight lines, made up of two quatrains, and a sestet, six lines, made up of two tercets, with a base metre of iambic pentameter, didum, 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 and a rhyme scheme of A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, G, E, F, G. Brooke does play around with the metre somewhat, with the substitution of trochees, dum-dee, and spondees, dum-dum, in places. A number of the lines are hyper-catalectic, i.e. they have 11 syllables rather than the regulation 10, with the addition of an extra unstressed syllable, either on the end of the line, as in lines 11 and 14, or inserted into the middle of the line, as in lines 6 and 7. Most lines are end-stopped, although there are three examples of enjambment. Sonnets also usually have a volta, or turn, marking the end of the octave and the beginning of the sestet. Simply put, the octave usually presents a problem or a situation, while the sestet either comments on this or provides a solution. In The Soldier... Brooke clearly marks the volta with a space between the octave and the sestet, 
but he does not so much explore a problem and then a solution as set out an argument in the first line that in the event of his death, this should not be mourned, and then use the remainder of the sonnet to detail his reasoning in support of this, i.e. in the remaining seven lines of the octave that his physical remains will, through their very Englishness, enrich the soil in which he is buried, and in the process make it English. And in the six lines of the sestet, that his soul, now purified, will be at one with the Almighty, giving back everything that England has gifted him. The first stanza thus explores his physical legacy, the natural imagery such as flowers, ways or paths, air, rivers and suns, evoking the idea of his country as a pastoral idyll. The second stanza explores his spiritual legacy and so focuses more on abstract qualities such as evil, thoughts, dreams, laughter and gentleness. This structure is also reminiscent of the words from the Book of Common Prayer used at Church of England burial services during the committal of the body to the ground, which considers the body first and then the soul. For as much as it hath pleased Almighty God of his great mercy to take unto himself the soul of our dear brother here departed, we therefore commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust ensure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be like unto his glorious body, according to the mighty working, whereby he is able to subdue all things to himself. There are six instances of the polyptotonic use of the word England or English, which heightens the patriotic power of the poem. The extensive use of listing highlights Brooke's belief in the abundance of England's positive qualities. The title, The Soldier, suggests that the I in the poem is a speaker rather than Rupert Brooke himself. The use of the definite article the rather than the indefinite a suggests that his speaker is an archetype or a generic albeit idealised figure. In this poem, the soldier believes he owes his sense of self to his country, and so he thus identifies as its son, whose duty it is to protect it, even if that means his own death. The poem's universal appeal meant that it was often read out at funerals in a bid to comfort those left behind that their loved one's death had not been in vain. The first line is hypothetical. It consists of the conditional mood, if I should, and the imperative mood, think. If I should die, think only this of me. The use of the colon here indicates that Brooke will elaborate on what this means. That there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. These lines are poignant, as the poem was not to remain hypothetical for long. Within a few months, he was, of course, dead and buried in a foreign field, or, more precisely, in an olive grove on the Greek island of Skyros. His burial in a foreign field will, he declares, effectively make the soil England for eternity. Note the use of enjambment here, which seamlessly connects the idea of a foreign field with England and evokes the seeming ease of the transformation. This is further enhanced by the alliteration of the F sounds in foreign field and the assonance of the E sounds in ever England. The caesura in the third line creates a powerful pause as he allows the significance and the gravity of this to sink in. He continues by explaining what he means by this. There shall be in that rich earth a richer dust concealed. Note the use of shall be here rather than will be. The word shall is definite and is used to indicate that something is required or promised. 
the richer dust alludes to his human remains and originates in the words of the burial service in the Book of Common Prayer. His body will effectively stake England's claim on the land, as his body will go from ashes to ashes, dust to dust, to become incorporated into the soil. Wars are generally fought over control of territory, so his death will effectively be an English victory, rather than an English defeat. Note the use of polyptoton here, where words derived from the same root but with different endings are repeated. Transformation of the adjective rich to its comparative form richer emphasises how his English dust is superior to the foreign earth into which he is being interred. Brooke progresses into the second quatrain using anadiplosis which is where a word from the end of one clause is repeated at the beginning of another. A dust whom England bore, shaped, made aware, as he justifies his claim that his dust is richer. Note the personification of England here, as a mother who has given birth to him, nurtured and educated him. He is a child of England, and she has made him who he is today. Brooke alters the rhythm of this line, substituting a spondy, dum-dum, in the fourth foot. The extra emphasis here, and the way in which the reader is forced to slow down slightly, giving equal importance to all the elements in this process. She is a generous mother, who gave once her flowers to love her ways to roam. Note the substitution of a trochee here to continue the rhythmic patterning of the previous line to emphasise England's gifts. She has allowed him to grow up in beauty and in freedom. He owes his identity to her. His is a body of England's breathing English air washed by the rivers, blessed by sons of home. Brooke evokes an image of England as an idyllic, pastoral land in an eternal summer, the essence of which permeates its people as they breathe its air. It's also a land which purifies and blesses. His diction here evokes the idea of baptism, a religious rite during which an individual's identity as a Christian is formally recognised. Note the use of a cinderton here, which not only builds up the intensity of the lines by effectively compressing the language, but also gives the feeling that the list of all the things England has done for him is potentially endless. The second stanza shifts from the burial of his bodily remains to his contemplation of his resurrection to eternal life. It begins with another imperative and think, this heart, all evil shed away. These words echo the ideas in the common book of prayer, which states that Christ will change our vile body, that it may be like unto his glorious body. What is also clear is that he believes the sacrifice he has made will cleanse his soul, which will then return to the immortal consciousness, or heaven, as he becomes a pulse in the eternal mind. A sense of equilibrium, or balance, has been maintained through his sacrifice. Through his death, he gives back to England what she gave him. No less gives somewhere back the thoughts by England given. Not only has England given him an earthly paradise in which to grow up, her sights and sounds, but she has also given him his character and values, Dreams happy as her day, and laughter learnt of friends and gentleness in hearts at peace under an English heaven. The harmony evoked by these lines is enhanced by the use of sibilance and alliteration. Note the way in which Brooke repeats the word heart in the first and final lines of the second stanza. To whose heart is he referring at the end? To the hearts of others such as he, who have died for their country and who are now at peace under an English heaven, 
i.e. at peace in their graves? Or to those for whom he has died, the living who are able to live at peace, i.e. in a peaceful land which is presided over by an English heaven? What is interesting to observe is that Brooke is so fiercely patriotic that he believes even heaven to be English. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.